Jurassic World Evolution 2 is the newest park builder and management game centered around you building a functional park with various dinosaurs now on the mainland. It is also the sequel to the highly successful Jurassic World Evolution game that was released in 2018. Jurassic World Evolution was created by Frontier Developments within a two or so year period after Universal had approached them asking them if they wanted to make a game to coincide with their newest Jurassic World film, which at the time was Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Seeing how Frontier had been wanting to make a dinosaur game, the opportunity seemed too great to pass up, so they took it. The 2018 game served as a proper comeback to a real park builder and management video game centered around dinosaurs, much like the well-received and still much-loved 2003 game Jurassic Park Operation Genesis. Only this time it was under different developers and under the rebranded Jurassic World title. Along with this, it also unfortunately lacked a lot of what originally made Jurassic World Jurassic World. And this is partly why Jurassic World Evolution 2 exists, to pretty much accommodate for everything that was missing from the first game, but also to progress its story since they seem to be progressing alongside the movies. Regardless, Regardless of the reasons, and despite Jurassic World Evolution's mostly positive reviews and reaction, many would agree that it was missing things. And based on what's been shown by the countless trailers, species field guides, and devlogs on Jurassic World Evolution 2, all released by Frontier themselves, it seems like this game was going to redeem the Evolution name by finally giving the fans what they've been asking for. Of course, this is what it seems. How it actually is, is a different story. And knowing that many people were going to want to see me play this this game, I've been racking my brain to how I wanted to approach this for my channel. Initially, I was going to livestream it, but then decided to make a playthrough of it for the second channel, but then decided to maybe wait on doing anything with it for a while. But then I realized that this was a pretty big event for the community, and I couldn't help but feel like I would be disappointed in myself in the future if I didn't take the time now to celebrate it properly by doing something with it for the main channel. So fuck it, today I'm going to be doing something different. Today, I'm going to walk you guys through my full experience playing this game, going through my every failure, every struggle, every success, which won't be much, and everything in between that occurs in my playthrough of this game. Join me as I attempt to beat Jurassic World Evolution 2. Before I get started with all of this, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention first to make sure you guys know what you're getting into. First off, this isn't supposed to be a review. The reason why I bring this up is because people are going to want to know how I feel about this game, and I do have something planned in terms of a review. But this specific video is supposed to be more of a commentary of everything that happened within the game from my personal experience with it. Second off, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to go into this only looking at the two main modes of the game, the campaign missions and chaos theory. I'm assuming that most of you are already already aware of what challenge mode and sandbox mode is and how it functions, and yeah, I understand that they may contain newer features as well, but this is supposed to be a document of my personal experience with the game, not a document of the game's new features. But don't worry, of the new features that I do happen to run into during my playthrough of this, I'll be sure to mention. And finally, I'm playing this game on the PS4, which may not seem like a big deal, but from what I've heard, PS4 players get less features than PS5 and PC players. What these features are? I'm not entirely sure, but some of my friends mentioned that it means that I can only have a certain amount of species in my park and I can't do mixed eras, which to me isn't that big of a deal. There might be more, I don't really know, but if you notice any limitations, just know that me playing this game on the PS4 is probably the reason. Anyways, I think that's it, so without further ado, let's play Jurassic World Evolution 2. November 9th, the day of the game's release. I started this day waking up at the ungodly hour of 4.30 a.m., realizing that I didn't even really know when the game was going to release, except for the fact that it was going to be sometime that morning. Eventually, I found out it wasn't going to be released until 6 a.m., so I decided to spend the remainder of my time preparing for everything. I got my recording equipment set up and tested, organized my files, and got everything up and running. And with only seconds left on the clock, I was ready to play. The game starts off with a brief but very nice intro of the events that have happened up to the point in which the game is set in. It pretty much goes through everything that happened in the movies, which is a little confusing because I expected the first game to have its own universe and I figured the second game would continue that story, but maybe the first game followed the movie story more than I realized. If I'm going to be completely honest, I didn't really follow that much on Jurassic World Evolution's story, so I can't really say. Regardless, it's a nice way to get us back into the gist of things, and it eventually segues into the first mission, which takes place in Arizona. 
For those of you that may not have followed along and are confused as to why we're in the states and not on the island anymore, the best explanation I can offer is that this second game is loosely following the narrative of the movies while attempting to create its own simultaneously. And if you remember the ending of the last Jurassic World movie, Fallen Kingdom, it clearly established that the story within the series is expanding beyond the island and onto the mainland. So naturally, the second game is going to do the same thing, but at the same time progress its own story, which is a continuation from the first game which took took place on the islands. I could be wrong about my assumptions, so if I am, just correct me in the comments down below. Anyways, we're left in Arizona, and my god this game looks gorgeous. If there's one thing that Frontier can deliver on, it's making their game look visually pleasing. And even without the tropical atmosphere that made the first game so vibrant and colorful, they did a great job making the desert landscape look so amazing and realistic. Here it's revealed that wild dinosaurs are on the loose, and it's our job to capture them and place them into nearby enclosures. The first dinosaur you have to capture is a loose baryonyx, and already the game is putting way too much trust in me thinking I'm a good enough shot to trank this guy. Once you're done with that, you place the dinosaur in the enclosure and pretty much accommodate for its every need. Which isn't that hard, it's only a full-on living, breathing dinosaur. And really, that's pretty much the gist for this first mission. Build enclosures, take care of the dinosaurs, and that's pretty much it. Luckily, there are some other things that you have to do to progress the game, and one of these things is obtaining wild dinosaurs. Since the game is no longer centered around you collecting fossilized materials, and extracting DNA to create dinosaurs, the way you have to obtain them now is by capturing loose ones. For some of these campaign missions, there will be two areas within the map, the buildable areas you can put all of your buildings and enclosures in, and the wild areas, where all of the loose and now wild dinosaurs are. This is how we capture the baryonyx, and to be honest, it's kind of cool, but unfortunately limited. One of the other highlights of this first mission, at least for me, was taking a look at all of the new features within the game. There's so many little things that Frontier decided to add, some of which are cool, and some of which I can take or leave. Some of the new additional features include the ability to speed up dinosaur transports by literally just fast forwarding it like a remote control. And you can actually do this for literally anything else in the park. If you want to trank a dinosaur, construct a building, have the ranger teams monitor your dinosaurs, you can literally use this fast forwarding button for anything in the game and it speeds it up like nothing. You have backup generators now, which basically replace the substations and are completely wireless. So now you you don't have to worry about pylons getting in the way of your enclosures or ruining the aesthetic of your park. But there is a catch, since they're generators, they run on limited fuel and need a refill every now and again, which you obviously have to pay for if you want the power to remain running. Along with that, dinosaurs now require a status checkup for you to see how they feel in their enclosures, which you have to do periodically. But you also have ranger posts that you can put inside the enclosures to monitor the dinosaurs in bulk. And along with all of this, in order to send out expeditions, you now have to recruit scientists to help you. So the way the expedition centers work in the first game is you sent out teams to various parts of the world to excavate and bring back materials and fossils that you can either use to excavate dinosaur DNA from or sell to make a little bit of money. That was back when the idea was to build a park. In this sequel where the idea is to capture and enclose loose dinosaurs, the expedition centers now go in areas around the world to do live captures and this is where the scientists come in. The scientists you recruit use their abilities and skills to perform these live captures that you assign to them and instead of bringing back rocks and fossil material, they bring you back loose dinosaurs they managed to capture. In this specific mission, the scientists I recruited captured four stegosaurs I had to prepare an enclosure for. As you can see, this is a beautiful and totally symmetrical enclosure and nobody can do better. And it looks like the stegosaurs love it. I mean, kind of, they are missing some vegetation. There's also new plants and shrubbery that you could put in the enclosures and each one offers something different to each dinosaur. In this case, the stegosauruses wanted some ground fruits. After I tried to give them that, they then decided they wanted more ground fiber. So I figured it would be easier to balance these two things with a bigger enclosure, and well, now we have this thing. A beautifully structured enclosure, that is. Man, I can't even lie to myself if I wanted to. And your final task of the mission is to try to make it past a sandstorm and the issues that come with it. And what I mean by that is the sandstorm will agitate the baryonyx and it will break out of its enclosure with a single hit to the fence, Jesus. After the baryonyx gets through the tinfoil fence, it's your job to trank it, secure it in its enclosure, and remember that you had a security bunker for your guests that you forgot about during one of the most crucial parts of your mission and no doubt got a bunch of people killed because of your little oopsie. But I guess they decided to ignore that mistake for me because I ended up passing the mission. 
The game then drops us off in Washington, where a dinosaur poaching ring was broken up by authorities after a disastrous event involving dinosaurs took place. And this means moving from a warmer desert region to a much colder tundra region. And just like Arizona, Washington in this game looks amazing, and it's awesome that we're able to see dinosaurs thrive in a snowy environment, even if it's not the most realistic thing. But it's still a pretty cool thing to see. Anyways, we pretty much start this mission by cleaning up the poacher's mess. And we're thrown right into the game. We started off by taking down a couple of car nodes and building a suitable enclosure for them. At least I tried, but a lone Gallimime has kind of gotten my way. He must have wandered too far from his herd, but he doesn't seem to be worried. In fact, it parked itself right in front of one of the car nodes I had tranked and doesn't seem too bothered by the fact that it's within the same vicinity as its now natural predator. I tried to build a fence between them so the car didn't try to make him his next meal, but he was very much in the way. But he seemed to have understand because he got up, walked away, and proceeded to lay down away from where I was building. That's a good galley. And as far as the Carnos go, they seem to be happy in their enclosure. Oh yeah, that reminds me. Perfect. This next part of the mission is actually really cool and I wish it lasted longer. So just like the map in the previous mission, this one is divided into two parts. One area that you can build your enclosures and buildings in, and the other that contains wild dinosaurs. And basically we're sent off to find a dangerous carnivore in the wild area and we have to progress down a trail and analyze our surroundings to track it down. This means finding clues like fallen trees and dead animals which eventually leads us down a long trail into the wild zone. It's soon revealed that it was an Allosaurus roaming around the area and from here she's our responsibility. And you know what that means, trank it, capture it, put it in a nice home, and watch it die because it's slowly losing health. Just like all my other pets. But yeah, it looks like we captured an injured Allosaurus, so from here we have to heal it. But not through the ranger station as we would have if we were playing the first game. Treating the dinosaurs' injuries and diseases is completely different in this game. Because instead of putting rangers in charge of everything including curing the dinosaurs of any ailments or injuries they might get, we now have the paleo medical facility for that. It pretty much functions the same as the ranger stations, but instead of rangers, it's a medical response team. And along with that, if your dinosaur is injured, instead of the team coming to you, you now have to take the dinosaur to the team and transport it to a pad behind the facility, where you assign the scientist to take care of the dinosaur for you. If your dinosaurs are sick, then you could just send a medical truck over to cure it, but in this case, it looks like the wild hasn't been too nice to this aloe because he's pretty beaten up. I sent my team to perform a medical scan on the allosaurus, but she didn't seem too happy about that. Once they got the scan, I sent her to the paleo medical facility to have her fixed up. My Carnotauruses seem to be worried about the Allosaurus, seeing how focused they are in the medical facility. Well, at least one of them looks worried. Larry seems to be doing alright. Yeah! Anyways, after all that bullshit, we just make the Allosaurus comfortable in its enclosure, and that's pretty much it. We passed the mission. What I liked about this mission is being able to explore the map a little bit, and I wish we did more of that. There was a real sense of danger and challenge there, but it was very short-lived. Seeing how this sequel's campaign is about capturing all of these dinosaurs in the wild and putting them in a safer place away from civilization, I would have expected a bit more of the venturing into the wild part of the game, but that's just me. Next, we move on to Pennsylvania, which seems like an odd choice seeing how everything else was more in the western region, but according to the game, this location serves as the official headquarters for housing all of the loose dinosaurs. And it actually kind of makes sense, since the whole dinosaurs are now on the loose thing is a national situation. We start this mission off by bringing in the Allosaurus and the Carnotaurus from the first mission and making them a permanent home here. I decided to at least try and make the Allosaurus' enclosure a bit more interesting by giving it a little island with its feeder in the middle of it, but that's about as creative as I can get, so let's move on. If I'm gonna be honest, Pennsylvania was probably the most boring mission out of everything in campaign mode. Trying to remember back to it, I can't recall a single notable event that actually happened aside from this asshole glitching outside of his enclosure. Nothing was broken and the gate was closed. How else could he have possibly made it out? At one point during the Allosaurus' breakout, one of the guests of the park ran up to it and died immediately. What the fuck were you expecting, man? You know what? I don't even feel bad. You definitely deserve that. Oh, what's this? A storm? Great. Just what I needed. It's like the game understood that I needed some content for this mission, so it's just throwing conflict my way. Don't worry guys, I've learned my lesson from the first storm. Sometimes you just have to take the bull by the horns, or in this case, take a helicopter and fly it right into the tornado. Hell yeah, this has a 99% real life success rate. Real life, try it yourself. Oh <laughs> wow, I didn't think that would actually work. Uh, I, I mean, of course it worked. Like I said, 99% success rate, real life. Try it yourself, uh, at your own risk. Uh, don't do that, you'll die. 
Also, in one part of the mission, I was supposed to increase the asset rating, so I added some new dinosaurs to my park. And this next part of the mission would take me so much longer than I care to admit. So, here's a summary. Since I already had some carnivores, I figured a little bit of variety would help me out, so I added in some ankylosaurs. No one looks very interested though. Okay, how about some diplodocuses? No? Parasaurolophuses? How about some Sigdinonychuses? So much for variety. Next off, Oregon. In this mission, I finally got to mess around with one of the bigger new additions that was heavily talked about for this game, the aviaries. In the first game, these things sucked. You couldn't customize them, you only had one species of pterosaur to work with, and they didn't really serve much besides a decoration for your park. But in this game, they are a massive improvement, not only because you can customize them now, you can also expand them and make them bigger. You also have more than one species to work with now, however, in this specific mission, we only really use the Tyrannus and it's around this point that I realized that the campaign doesn't really utilize a lot of the newer aspects of the game. This sequel also has aquatic creatures, new dinosaur animations, new dinosaur species, and so on. But unfortunately, none of that is really showcased in the campaign, even though they could have found a way to implement them in there and make it more exciting. And this is one of the few times where we see the new features, but there really isn't much to this mission for it. The game had me build an aviary, had me assign one of my scientists to perform a live capture to obtain some pteranodons and put them inside their enclosure. Pretty much the same setup from the previous missions, except this time it's with the aviary. After that, asset ratings, comfort levels, mission completed. Next, the game takes us to the final mission, which happens to take place in the most awful place in the world. A place filled with crackheads and is known for having one of the highest homeless populations in the US. Easy pickings for the dinosaurs. Yes, people, I'm talking about California. Jesus, who would live here? You would have to be a massive loser to live in this state, let me just tell you. In this game, though, we actually get to venture into the of California that's actually beautiful, and Frontier did a good job in making it look that way. In this mission, the map is set up like the first two missions maps, where there's a buildable area and a restricted wild area. In the wild area, it's pretty much dominated by only herbivores with the exception of one baryonyx that I saw. And around this first part of the mission, I got to venture through the area and take pictures of dinosaurs, but the Triceratops didn't seem too happy about that. It was cool to be able to do that again, but it's time to build some enclosures because we have some dinosaurs to catch and asset ratings to increase. What else is new? And like the dumbass I am, I decided to build my first enclosure as far away from the base as possible, which is never a good idea at the start of building a park. But what can I say, I'm a rebel. Or just stupid, I really don't know. Regardless of the reason, this mission actually has me very excited, not because of the mission itself, but because it's giving me the option to pick out whatever available carnivore to bring back from a live capture and one of those dinosaurs was the Cryolophosaurus. The Cryolophosaurus is one of the new additions to the Evolution series and one that actually has a bit of history with the franchise by appearing in the Warpath Jurassic Park game, which I'm sure many people fondly remember. I don't because I never played it, but hey, I'm always down to see a new species added to the game. And I'm sure everyone else is too, and no doubt everyone definitely picked this guy for their first dinosaur in the California park. I sure did and even used the fast forwarding feature in the game to speed up the process which I'm going to be honest, I completely forgot about until this point in my playthrough. And man, do I regret it. At first, I thought speeding up everything was a cheap way of progressing through the game, but at this point, I don't even care. This thing is amazing, and I definitely should have used it earlier. And from this point on, I pretty much use it for the rest of the playthrough, which is great because it will mean overcoming some of the even more repetitive and tedious things that will come later in this video. Anyways, I noticed that in this map, there was a pretty big hill in the middle of it, which usually makes it so it obstructs any builds on top of it. But I decided to use this to my advantage and enclose the whole area as one big enclosure that I plan to put something more difficult in, since it's also near a response team. And Troodon seemed like the perfect choice for this enclosure. Admittedly, it does seem a bit oversized for the tiny dinosaurs, but I still think the overall aesthetic to it looks nice. And there's still plenty of room to build, so no harm done. Next, we add in some Allosauruses, a couple of Metrocanthosauruses, and maybe some Dilophosauruses. It was pretty hard to keep the Dilos comfortable, and the fact that they kept getting sick didn't really help. Several breakouts and illnesses later, I was able to get everything under control, for now at least. 
It looks like my park is really coming together, and as always, this asset ratings mission is taking me too long to finish. But I eventually finished the mission, and that's it. The campaign ends with some final words from our main characters that helped us along the way that I completely forgot to mention because who cares? And we get some pretty cool cinematics to cap everything off. And that was my experience playing campaign mode of Jurassic World Evolution 2. I guess to give some brief thoughts, it was nothing too special in terms of story, but there were a lot of cool aspects of the campaign that I did enjoy. Like the settings and some areas of certain missions, like the Allosaurus tracking one, that was really cool. Anyways, now that we're finished with that, it's time to move on to Chaos Theory Mode. When Jurassic World Evolution 2 was announced, Chaos Theory was one of the things that was revealed alongside everything else. But at the time, Frontier didn't say much about it, but on the official website, the description read, Chaos Theory Mode lets you play through key moments of your favorite films with a twist. Experience what-if moments from iconic Jurassic Park and world films. Now, I didn't do very much in terms of trying to stay up to date with the game prior to its release, so I didn't really know what Chaos Mode was supposed to be. At first, I thought this was just supposed to be another version of Challenge mode but Frontier was promoting this thing to be a mode of its own and one that was supposed to offer a different experience. It's supposed to be something new, something unique. Is that what we're going to get? Let's find out. Chaos Theory Mode provides five scenarios, one from each era of the movies. And each one has a story that pertains to that specific scenario with different missions and characters, at least for the most part. And obviously, the first one we're going to go through is the Jurassic Park one. In this what-if scenario, we're taken back before the events of Jurassic Park to give our personal spin on what a successful park could look like. We're supposed to learn from the movie's mistakes and attempt to make a fully operational Jurassic Park alongside John Hammond. The game starts off with another one of these really cool intros that all of these scenarios have, and builds its way up to you starting your very own Jurassic Park. And I'm ready. I've watched this movie thousands of times. I've watched them make their mistakes thousands of times. Surely I can build a functional Jurassic Park that's safe for all guests, right? Wrong. Things went wrong. Very wrong. To give you guys some context on what happened, it's simple. I was an idiot. Seriously, looking back at it now, there were a lot of things that could have been changed about my park that definitely would have prevented a lot of the chaos that would eventually ensue. So let's go through them. The first half of the game is just passing missions to prepare for the opening of Jurassic Park. That means building certain structures like the Expedition Center and the Hatchery, along with creating some dinosaurs and putting them in suitable enclosures. To be honest, it just felt like I was playing the first game but with the Return to Jurassic Park DLC. I mean, it's the same setting, the same process, the same goal. You get dinosaurs from the Expedition Center again and hatch them in the hatcheries. But hey, at least you can release more than one dinosaur now, that's pretty cool. But yeah, the first part is pretty basic so I won't go too in-depth with that. The second part of this is where the issues came. I would eventually bring other dinosaurs dinosaurs to my park like Triceratops, Parasaurolophus, Dilophosaurus, and place them all in their individual enclosures. The problem? Well, first off, I was way too generous with the size of the enclosures. Second off, like the dumbass I am, I thought it would be a good idea to space them out so far apart. Which is something that I already did earlier in this game, and something that I did point out in this video, and you think I would have learned from that, but no, I'm just stupid. And it wasn't even bad the first time around because nothing really happened, but it would be bad now because in one mission, I had to connect a safari trail to each enclosure so people can see all my dinosaurs better. And having the enclosures so far apart meant I was spending more money on paths. So yeah, definitely could have used my money better, but oh well, this is just how my park is now. Hopefully nothing bad happens to it like a storm or something. Oh, would you look at that, a storm. Yeah, I don't think I'm recovering from this one, boys. You know what? I think this has taught us a valuable lesson, and that trying to reattempt this park by learning our lessons from the movie was always going to be futile. Actually, now that I think of it, I literally did the same mistakes and expected different results. Let's see here. What does that make me? Oh. I think this is a good time to move on anyways. Onwards to San Diego. This is the scenario that I, and probably everyone else, was looking forward to the most. We get to try our hand on making our very own San Diego Park, which is really cool. Except for the fact that it's back in the loser state of California. But disregarding that, everything else is pretty neat. And for this part, I ended up playing it as safe as possible. 
To give you guys an idea, sometime in the beginning of the story to this part, there was a mission where you had to house two T-Rexes, which were Buck and Doe, you know, the T-Rexes from the second movie because this is trying to imitate the Lost World aesthetic. And I ended up putting them in separate enclosures out of fear that they wouldn't like each other and want to break out or fight. Here's the thing, I didn't actually realize it was supposed to be Buck and Doe. Had I known, I would have put them in the same enclosure and it probably cost me more to build separate enclosures, so if anything, I made things harder for myself. I never said I was big brained. Along with that, I didn't really know how I was supposed to use the amphitheater at first, so I just kind of ignored it for the rest of my playthrough. I don't know if it's because I was caught up with the missions, or if I just didn't care enough to use it right away, or if I knew how to use it at all, but yeah, I didn't use it, and now it's just this giant thing in the middle of my park that has no attraction to it because I didn't attach an enclosure to it. Maybe it's because this segment takes place in California. Everyone knows your IQ automatically decreases as soon as you're in this state. Anyways, I would go through this segment chronologically, but if I'm going to be honest, San Diego wasn't much of a different experience in terms of gameplay as literally everything else in the game. So some dinosaurs get brought in, I have to make enclosures for them, make sure they're happy, research some things, dinosaurs break out, tranquilize them, make them happy again, put in some buildings, make some new dinosaurs, put them in the park, make them happy, change your game to 3 times speed and watch the compies jump around like they just snorted a line of cocaine, you get the picture. I know I said that this was my favorite scenario out of the 5, but looking back at it, there wasn't a lot that actually happened that was different or unique from the rest of the things that I did so far. Really I just spent a lot of the time experimenting with the more management side of the game. Like where to put buildings and listening to what the people wanted. Probably because the game had me do missions that revolved around those kinds of things. Because you know, it actually wants me to manage my park. Which is, you know, the whole point of this game. I also got to finally hatch and see the Seal of Isis, which was an addition of the game that I was really excited for. That was really cool. But by the end of it, I only got through 83% of the story on this one. Gonna be honest, after spending a few hours with this, I really got bored and just dipped. So let's move on to Jurassic Park 3. Jurassic Park 3's Chaos Theory story is actually very different from the other two that I've played so far, because the other two felt like actual what-if scenarios. What if you were in charge and built Jurassic Park next to John Hammond? What if you made the San Diego exhibit a reality? And yeah, those two parts had stories to them, but after the basics, they let you loose and do your thing, and if you passed, you passed, and if you failed, you failed. In Jurassic Park 3's case, however, it is extremely linear to the point where it is almost impossible for you to fail. And the reason why I bring this up is because when things like this part of chaos theory is so linear, it makes it harder for me to fuck up and because I can't fuck things up, there's no content because let's be honest, people love watching me be stupid in these games. But no, it's like Evolution 2 was getting tired of all my fuck ups and gave me a bare bones section of chaos theory that would be impossible for anyone, even I, a dumbass, could fuck up. And to be honest, that's extremely disappointing. But seriously, all jokes aside, and to give more context, this whole section is following a young Simon Mazrani, who was casted terribly. We will do it again. In addition to capturing the dinosaurs, which will serve as our foundation, I purchased InGen because I believe in the science. In his endeavors of cleaning things up after the events of the original trilogy and begin the process of building Jurassic World. And while this sounds like it could potentially have all sorts of cool what if moments, it's unfortunately dumbed down to you having a very small space to work with to build one single temporary enclosure. Because all you do from here is go into the wild, train some dinosaurs, bring them back to said enclosure, and then send them off site. You do this again, and again, and holy shit the raptors just fucking killed the Spinosaurus, and again, and that's it. You past the mission. I wish I could describe my experience with this section, but there's literally nothing here that's worth mentioning due to how little there was to really do. Hopefully Jurassic World is better because that's where we're going to now. In this part of Chaos Theory, the game lets us go back to actual park building. As great as it is to be able to be back doing this, nothing much has really changed about it except the setting. In the Jurassic World segment, we pretty much continue the story from the Jurassic Park 3 segment and follow Mazrani and his crew to start the process of building Jurassic World. And for me, like the rest of these park building scenarios, the start was pretty slow. I just followed the missions and began the process of putting my park together so nothing notable really happened. This segment was set up like the first two where a good portion of the beginning is dead 
dedicated to preparing for the park's opening. The game gave me some dinosaurs to work with as well, like some ankylosaurs, triceratops, and a T-Rex. Once I got everything settled there, it was time to open the park and prepare for whatever inevitable chaos that would result from a decision like this. I mean, let's be honest, if history has taught us anything, it's that I'm not the best person to be trusted with running a dinosaur-themed park. But to be honest, I actually did okay for most of this segment. But it was pretty boring. Most of it was just trying to make the guests happier by adding and configuring amenities, restrooms, storm shelters, and so on. As I was doing that, I was also expanding my park, adding in new species from the Expedition Center like Ceratosaurus, Gallimimus, Compsognathus. I think what was really annoying about this segment was how long it took for me to complete missions. I don't know if it's because I was doing things wrong or if the games glitched, but no matter what I did, the guests were just not satisfied with anything. No matter how I configured the amenities, no matter how many bathrooms, shelters, and accommodations I provided, no matter how many dinosaurs I added, they just weren't having any of it. I'm not even joking, after a few hours worth of recording absolutely nothing, I ended up just stopping and continued without recording because I didn't want my computer's storage to be even more filled up with even more hours of boring footage of nothing. Trust me, I had enough of that already and I was worried with how much space I had left to record. And I still had the final segment of Chaos Theory to record, so yeah, I didn't really have much of a choice. And as I'm getting a little stressed because I can't seem to figure out how to complete these missions, of course the game has to go and crash on me. This is when I decided to quit this segment for now and just moved on to the next one, so let's go to the Fallen Kingdom segment. The Fallen Kingdom segment is sort of like Jurassic Park 3 in the sense that it's kind of linear, but at least in this one it gives us more to do and a bit more freedom to do it. And I think it's really cool that they set it in a fallen Jurassic World setting where the park has fallen apart and all the dinosaurs are loose and everywhere. It almost feels like an apocalyptic world but instead of zombies or aliens it's with dinosaurs. The story here revolves around Claire and Owen coming back to clean up the park after the events of Jurassic World and that's pretty much it. This one doesn't take too long to finish and again it's somewhat linear so it's easy to complete as well. Despite that, it was miles better than Jurassic Park 3 just for the setting alone. It's so cool to be able to venture through a completely fallen Jurassic World park like this. And I finally got to see the Mosasaurus tank. But then I realized that this segment took place after the events of Fallen Kingdom, so the Mosasaurus had already escaped at this point, even though the game inadvertently proves that this is impossible because the tank isn't connected to the ocean in any way. But I'm not here to debunk things, I'm here to play the game. So one of the first things I was sent to do was fix up some buildings and perform a status check on some of the dinosaurs. This is it. This is my time to shine and show the world how great of a driver I am. Shit. Damn it. Pardon me. Fuck. Not sure how I managed to flip the car over. Damn it again? And... Perfect parking. Hell yeah. Anyways, from here we had to fix up some more things and give ourselves a bit of power to build our temporary base of operations. Once that was all set, I was tasked to trank and enclose some dinosaurs, and of course, mistakes were made. The first dinosaurs I was sent to trank were three Brachiosauruses. Unfortunately, I had tranked one near some Allosauruses, so by the time I was done at least attempting to transport this dinosaur, the Allosauruses got to it first, and now I only have two Brachiosauruses. We pretty much have to do this mission a couple more times. For the next part, I was tasked to capture capture a baryonyx because it's one of the few dinosaurs that seems to be losing a lot of health. After I put it in a suitable enclosure and performed a status check on it, I then had to perform a medical scan on it, but before I can do that, the baryonyx died and I failed the mission. This was weird to see because this was the first time the game had specifically told me that I had failed the mission. Luckily I got to pick up from my last save and reattempted the mission, but of course if it's not one problem, it's another. Because the baryonyx then broke out of its enclosure, to which a random allosaurus just welcomed itself in. I got that problem squared away though. Next, I had to segregate some Sinoceratops and Triceratops because they refused to see past horn and frill shapes and kept trying to kill each other. One day these guys will come together and accept that even though they're different on the outside, they're still both Ceratopsids on the inside. This was a risky joke, please laugh. After that, we finally get to go back to not one, but two of these tracking missions that I really liked from the Washington mission on campaign mode. And that's because out of all of these dinosaurs, there's two notable ones that have been missing during our time here so far. And one of those dinosaurs is Blue. So I got to go track Blue down through the wild area of the map, and unsurprisingly, the tracking doesn't feel that different from the initial tracking mission, and even reuses the same dead deer. I mean, I feel like it would have made more sense to use a Gallimimus or something, but okay. Anyways, it was a pretty short-lived mission, and of course I found Blue and put in a suitable enclosure. Next, we had to find the T-Rex, and the tracking was structured exactly the same. 
We find her, put her in an enclosure, and make sure she's happy. Once that's all done, we tend to blue a little bit since she's been beaten up from the wild, and after that, we just send her and the T-Rex off the island. Because I guess she needs a blood transfusion or something, and they can't do it there on the island for some reason? I, I don't know. I was too distracted after Owen said this. Blue is family. Hopefully this is the closest thing we ever get to a Fast and Furious and Jurassic World crossover. Anyways, after we send them off site, that's it. We finished this segment and that concludes Chaos Theory mode. Well, at least most of it. I still need to finish everything else, but you know what? 84% completed is a pretty good start in my book. Anyways, that was my experience playing through Chaos Theory mode. To give some brief thoughts, it was okay. From the parts that I played, it was nothing too special or different. I don't want to say too much right now because I think I'll feel better about giving my thoughts after I finish more of it. But for now, consider this to be my first impressions of this mode, even though I did complete like 84% of it. Thank you for joining me on this journey through Jurassic World Evolution 2. It was definitely an enjoyable game for the most part. I don't want to say too much about how I feel about the game because I do have something planned as a sort of review for it later. I know I already gave some thoughts on certain aspects of the game, but it was really hard to continue this experience without giving at least some of my thoughts on it along the way. But I'll be sure to have a more in-depth review out at some point. Really, this video was just supposed to be a fun look into the game without giving it much thought, and I had a great time. There's probably going to be some people out there that are going to be mad that I didn't 100% everything or unlock everything and don't worry, I do plan to go back and unlock everything else and at least attempt to 100% everything. But the reason why I did it this way is because if anyone has followed this channel long enough, you'll know that I've never been much of a completionist. So I don't sweat as much on trying to get everything unlocked as quickly as possible. That and I was also running out of storage on my laptop for all of the recordings. I have about 12 and a half hours worth of recorded Jurassic World Evolution 2 gameplay, so that's gonna be fun to sort out and edit through. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know it was very different from how I usually do videos now, but you know, it was still fun to do and definitely let me know if this was something that you guys enjoyed because I do have other games that I can do this kind of video structure for. Anyways, along with that, I also want to say that uh, we're almost at 20,000 subscribers. I think at this point we are at somewhere between like 1.5 and 1.6k subscribers away from 20,000. One of my goals is to see if we can reach 20,000 thousand before the end of the year. If we can do that, that'd be awesome. Don't worry guys, I haven't forgot, you know, just, just for those of you that have remembered and uh, <laughs> has, had seen the community post, uh, I will fulfill my promise. If we reach 20,000 subscribers, I will react to the entirety of Dinosaur Adventures. I think it's what it's called, that stupid fucking low quality trash movie. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the movie that has the ye dinosaur meme. So if we reach 20,000 subscribers for the main channel, I will react to that movie in its entirety because I'm pretty sure I could do that because I'm pretty sure the production studio no longer exists so I'm pretty sure that I can literally get away with watching the whole thing without having to change anything for the sake of avoiding a copyright strike so but yeah just a friendly reminder of the fact that I'm willing to lose brain cells for a subscriber goal. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching this video. This was a very fun video to put together and that's pretty much all I have to say for now. Thank you guys so much for watching and please have a nice day.